Right, well, um, welcome to the Royal Society today. Thank you for coming uh, through so much rain to hear our, our two speakers today. Normally we only have one, so you're, you're very lucky today. Um, I'm Felicity Henderson. I'm the uh, Events and Exhibitions Manager at the Royal Society, um, and uh, I'll be organising some History of Science events uh, over the next year and in the coming years. Um, today I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague Rupert Baker, who is the Library Manager here at the Royal Society. Uh, no doubt some of you have already um, either emailed him or spoken to him uh, as he's been organising this fantastic series of lectures now for, um, I think, a couple of years. Uh, and Rupert's going to do the first part of the uh, talk today, and then the second part is going to be done by Jenny Thomas. Jenny. Uh, Jenny is a PhD student at Queen Mary and she's doing her thesis on uh, the repository of the Royal Society and its uh, dispersal in the 18th century. And so Jenny's going to do the second part of the talk. Okay. Right, thanks Felicity. Um, first of all, I'd better just check that everyone can hear my librarianly croak at the back of the, uh, back of the room. Um, <clears throat> yes, just to expand a little on the format for today's event, I'm going to be speaking for a um, eight or ten minutes, and then Jenny will be continuing the talk, um, talking about the history of the Society's repository or museum. Um, that should be about 30 minutes of talk between us, and then we'll be available to answer questions after that. Um, and then we will split up into groups, um, some of you to look at the archives and books out at the front of the room, others to go down to the um, exhibition in the basement here. Um, everyone will get a chance to see everything. Um, if you're in a rush to be off by two o'clock, I suggest you get in one of the early groups to go downstairs. Um, last time we did downstairs tours, we had about 20 people. Today, I think we've got about 55, so it will be uh, an interesting experience. Um, so before Jenny tells us in detail about the Society's repository, I'd like to kind of prepare the ground for her by looking at um, the kind of collections that were being assembled before the Royal Society came along. Um, and showing you some slides from these books um, I've put out on display at the front of the room, books on early museum collections. Um, and that will provide a background for Jenny to show how the Royal Society's approach differed from the earlier culture of collecting. Um, to begin our story, we need to go back to Renaissance Italy and the emergence of an antiquarian impulse um, at the beginning of the 16th century, which led around 1550 to a vogue for establishing museum collections and subsequently the creation of public museums such as the Uffizi in Florence. Uh, meanwhile, private individuals were establishing collections of objects which came to be known as cabinets of curiosities, um, also by the related terms Wunderkammern or Kunstkammern. Um, these were an eclectic mix of specimens from natural history, mineralogy, um, historical relics and antiquities, and artefacts from exotic cultures. Uh, this slide on screen at the moment is the earliest pictorial representation of a cabinet of curiosities. It's from a 1599 book, um, Dell'Historia Naturale, by uh, Ferrante Imperato, who was a pharmacist from Naples. Um, and in the picture you can see his bookcases on the right, um, mineral specimen cabinets on the left, and a rather impressive um, stuffed crocodile on the ceiling. <laughs> Apparently that's Imperato and his son, um, pointing to all the natural historical displays hung from the ceiling. Um, these cabinets functioned as symbols of power for their aristocratic owners, um, demonstrating that they had the financial and cultural ability to reproduce the entire world in microcosm within their own four walls. Um, here's another um, notable collection, image from a notable collection. Um, this is one accumulated by Ulisse Aldrovandi, the Italian naturalist, who was later described by Linnaeus as the father of natural history studies. Um, Aldrovandi's collection numbered more than 7,000 specimens. Um, he called it his theatre of nature, and he left it to the Senate of Bologna in his will, where it became part of the Museo Cospiano. Um, we have the book of the Museo Cospiano collections downstairs in the basement exhibition, so we'll see that um, in this spectacular frontispiece when we go, around, when we go downstairs. Um, the culture of collecting as well as providing prestige for the owner of the collection, um, also began to be connected with the emergence of the ideas for a new science put forward by people like Francis Bacon and others. Uh, as mon one modern writer has commented, uh, cabinets of curiosities 
encouraged comparisons and favoured the cultural change from a world viewed as static to a dynamic view of endlessly transforming natural history and a historical perspective that led in the 17th century to the germs of a scientific view of reality. Um, however, as one of our frequent library readers, Professor Michael Hunter, has noted, um, these cabinets of curiosity were also the quintessential appendage of a successful virtuoso. Um, and one definition of a virtuoso is um, someone with a love of the rare, the exotic, the marvellous and the inexplicable. So you can see how in the early days of the Royal Society, the, the fellows who like to call themselves virtuosi and the more scientifically minded Baconian natural philosophers um, could have been at odds r regarding the real purpose of a museum. Um, that's something that Jenny will uh, expand upon later. Uh, meanwhile, cabinets of curiosities were springing up all over Europe. Um, the illustration on the right-hand side of this slide is the frontispiece from the Museum Wormianum, uh, which is the printed catalogue of the collection of the Copenhagen doctor Ole Worm, Worm, who used his specimens as teaching resources for his students. Uh, the Museum Wormianum catalogue is out on display, um, along with the Imperato volume, the earliest depiction of a uh, natural history collection that I mentioned earlier and also um, a volume on the Jesuits Collegio Romano Museum, which was compiled by the um, eclectic, to say the least, Jesuit scholar Athanasius Kircher, um, who's a great Egyptologist as well. I've, I've got a spectacular plate there of um, e um, Egyptian images. Uh, it's not supposed to be a detachable plate, but it has become one. Um, and on a, slight, <laughs> on a slight tangent, something I was going to mention, um, the three books I pulled up, are all in rather fragile condition. Um, and just to mention an initiative that we're launching in the library in the build-up to our 2010 350th anniversary celebrations, and we're going to be launching an adopt-a-book sponsorship scheme. Um, Felicity is leading on that one, so if you'd like to talk to her after the event, it's just in the early stages at the moment, but uh, I'm sure Felicity will be able to provide more information on that one. Um, so this European culture of collecting found its way to Europe um, via the reports of gentlemen travellers uh, who were on kind of early versions of the Grand Tour. And they visited cab cabinets of curiosity in Italy and elsewhere in Europe and returned to England full of admiration for the rarities they'd seen. Um, this form of travel was encouraged by Francis Bacon. He saw it as an essential part of the development of a gentleman's moral education. And it was practised by aristocrats such as um, Thomas Howard, the second Earl of Arundel, who's pictured on the left of this slide. Uh, he travelled to Italy with the architect Inigo Jones, and Arundel became a great collector, and I'm sure many of you know that uh, he was a great book collector. And the Norfolk Library, which he augmented on a later trip to Nuremberg in 1636, is really the basis of the Royal Society Library's historical collections. Um, the gentleman on the right, John Tredescant the Elder, uh, was the founder, as I'm sure many of you also know, of the most significant cabinet of curiosities in England in the period before the Royal Society. Tredescant travelled widely um, as a head gardener to a succession of noblemen, and he accumulated a collection of natural history and ethnographic curiosities, which he housed in Lambeth in his famous Ark, Tredescant's Ark. Um, the collection was continued by Tredescant's son and then passed to the antiquary Elias Ashmole, FRS, who in turn donated it to the University of Oxford, um, and that became the basis for the Ashmolean, which opened in 1683 as the first public museum in Britain. Uh, that's a little bit ahead of the Royal Society story, so we'll turn back to the 1660s and look at the early days of the Society and how the Royal Society's museum collection came into existence and how it built on, but also differed from, um, earlier Cabinet of Curiosity ideas. Uh, so for that, I'll hand over to Jenny. Well, as Rupert identified, although cabinets of curiosity may well have had a scientific purpose, this purpose was really dwarfed by their wanting to display wonderful and rare objects. And this is something that the Royal Society, when setting up their cabinet, really didn't want to do. They wanted to create a scientific cabinet designed to help learning with an emphasis on discovery. As Robert Hooke, who in 1663 became the repository's first curator, describes, the use of such a collection is not for wonder and gazing, as it is for the most part thought and esteemed, but for the most serious and diligent study of the most able proficient in natural history. <laughs> 
Although the scientific uses of the repository were key, the Society were also keen to stress that it was a place that would preserve both the object donated and, crucially, the legacy of its benefactor. The first volume of Philosophical Transactions states that whatsoever is presented as rare and curious will be with great care, together with the donors' names and the beneficiaries recorded, and the things preserved for after ages, probably much better and safer than in their own private cabinets, and um, we'll discover later that that really is very far from true, and in progress of time will be employed for considerable philosophical and useful purposes. The repository was a serious undertaking for the Royal Society, and not for curiosity and wonder, but for the dual purposes of preservation and the furtherance of knowledge. As we shall see, achieving these aims was not as easy as you might think. In the early years of the repository, the Society had to contend with the problem of making the repository scientific, in addition to increasing the number of British specimens in their collection. Whilst from the beginning of the 18th century, they had the added problem of successfully preserving the objects themselves. From the formation of the Royal Society, and as Michael Hunter identifies, who has written most extensively on the repository, the Royal Society found that they accumulated both natural and artificial material, such as Boyle's air pump, and you'll see downstairs on display a similar but later air pump from Hawkesby. However, it was not until February 1666, when the Society's meetings recommenced after the plague, that the repository was significantly swelled, following the purchase of Robert Hubert's Cabinet of Rarities, using a donation of £100 from Daniel Colwell. Hubert's Cabinet was well known in London, and could be visited at the place called the Music House at the Mitre, near the west end of St Paul's Church, for a very reasonable fee. In Hubert's Cabinet, there were a disproportionate number of exotic objects of natural history, in comparison with their British counterparts, which is perhaps unsurprising, given that Hubert's preoccupation was with rarity and strangeness, rather than with science. However, as Gru asserts in his preface to the printed catalogue of the repository in 1781, the repository should include not only things strange and rare, but the most known and common amongst us. Not merely for that what is common in one country is rare in another, but because likewise it would yield a great abundance of matter for any man's reason to work upon. And he uses the examples of um, dog's ears and dog's ears that are pricked up and dog's ears that are sort of droopy. And he, he tries to, to make some sort of assertions about why, why they're different and comparing those is, is a really useful thing to do. So to rectify this imbalance between nat native and non-British specimens, the Society employed botanical traveller Thomas Willisell, who was paid £30 to search after and collect whatever nature may have stored every respective county with, be they minerals, vegetables or animals. And Willisell de delivered the first consignment consisting of plants gathered in several parts of England and Scotland, together with some rare Scottish fish and fowl, to Arundel House in 1669. Since further references to Willisell's collecting on behalf of the Society are not apparent, it is likely that this was the first and only batch of objects collected by him. However, the Society's enthusiasm for collecting the natural productions of Britain did not seem to wane, as in January 1677, they seized the opportunity of Robert Plotz making a survey of England to charge him with accommodating them with natural curiosities, which he may meet, in exchange for his being excused from making weekly payments to the Society. So that was one problem with the collection as it stood, the disproportionate number of non-British specimens. But there was a further problem. Hubert's collection was a cabinet of curiosity, in the strictest sense, emphasising the strange and the monstrous. In Gru's printed catalogue of the repository, first published in 1681, he attempts to realign the collection from this focus on the extraordinary to be more scientific, both in the language used to describe the specimens and in his re-identifying the specimens. The most striking example of this being the transformation of Hubert's giant's thigh bone to the much less astonishing elephant's thigh bone. And an extinct sea monster, which you might not get extinct sea monster from this, um, donated by, found by John Sumner and donated by the then Archbishop of Canterbury to the, again, slightly less exciting rhinoceros. Or you probably wouldn't get rhinoceros from that either, mind you. Um, my favourite example is a sprig or large bunch of black feathers, so just a, a bunch of feathers that Hubert had collected, which he describes, the Emperor Matthias gave $2,000 for it, which is almost £500 sterling. It was taken out of the treasury of rarities at Prague, and doth exceed that which the master of rarities did see of the great Turks at Constantinople. This grew, he writes, describing them as a bunch of black feathers from the lesser ash-coloured or grey heron. During its very early years, the repository's visitors were impressed by its state and scope. 
Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosmo III, in 1669, predicted that in time it will be the most beautiful, the largest and the most curious in respect to natural productions that is anywhere to be found. And 20 years later, in 1689, Christian Huygens visits, and again his comments suggest that things are still going pretty well, describing a cabinet of curiosities, very full, but well kept up. The good opinion didn't last for long, though, unfortunately. A little less than 15 years later, in 1703, Paradis Edward Ward's London, Sky com- London Spy Complete describes the repository as full of antiquated trumpery, memorandums of mortality, rusty relics and philosophical toys. But the most widely discussed criticism of the repository, and perhaps the most damning, came from German traveller Zacharias Conrad von Offenbach, who you probably are quite familiar with, following a visit in July 1710. He describes that the objects were not only in no sort of order or tidiness, but covered with dust, filth and coal smoke, and many of them utterly broken or ruined. If one inquires after anything, the operator who shows strangers round will usually say, a rogue had stolen it away, or he will show you pieces of it saying it is corrupted or broken. And such is the care they take of things, hardly a thing is to be recognised, so wretched do they all look. So why did things go wrong? Well, the society's rooms in Gresham College were contingent on Hook's presence, and so following his death in 1703, they were asked to leave. Although the then president, Sir Isaac Newton, successfully negotiated that they stay until alternative rooms could be found, it took the society a further seven years to find this alternative accommodation. So these negative comments, particularly often about, could be seen to have been made during a transitional period in the repository's life as it waited to be transferred. By 1711, the repository was transferred to a purpose-built house in Crane Court, Fleet Street, a building which was quite possibly designed by Sir Christopher Wren and was his last building, and which was overseen by Richard Waller. And here's a sketch of it. This is the only existing image of the repository, um, and it was drawn in around 1730 when the repository was being refurbished. And those of you who are close to the screen will probably see that... Oh, and um, probably see that there's actually some costings here for some wainscoting in deal. Um, the repository was apparently wainscoted in deal in 1730. Again, initially, things seemed to go fairly well. Notwithstanding frequent complaints about the cheesemonger, Samuel Clements, who rented the cellar below the repository and the ill scent of his goods, and the unexpected departure of the repository's keeper, Alban Thomas, because of suspected Jacobite sympathies. But, yeah, things were going well. The repository was being used for useful and philosophical purposes, as they wanted it to be in philosophical transactions. Um, And, for example, Richard Bradley draws heavily on the collections in his philosophical account of the works of nature. So you've got various images here, that, a number of which are from Royal Society objects. I won't go through them all for pressure of time. There's a bird of paradise here. If any of you are taxidermists, I think it's very interesting the way that he's drawn them, and I wonder if it tells you anything about the way that they were stuffed at the time. If anybody has any ideas on that, I'd be really interested to know. Um, Still, by August 1729, the condition of the repository had begun to deteriorate once again. A report of the committee appointed to inspect the repository describes the curiosities therein contained were several of them decayed and the rest of them in great disorder. This led the committee to embark upon a five-year project to restore the repository and its objects. Um, Most notably on the committee was um, one Dr Hans Sloan. One of the most striking findings of the committee was that the repository should have contained in excess of 5,000 objects, but only a fraction of these, just 1,775, were found in 1734. Perhaps perhaps even more surprisingly, approximately 100 less than were contained in Grew's original catalogue. And this is a graph. Again, the people at the back, probably the people at the front, can't see it very well, but it's the objects broken down according to class. Um, and you can see the, the middle bar here, the purpley bar, is the projected, uh, the projected figures. That's what should have been in the repository in 1734, based on Grew's catalogue and the subsequent donations recorded in the um, various journal books. Um, this is Grew's catalogue here, so this is what was there in 17 and 1681, and then this is the actual. So you'll find that actually there's a lot more similarity between Gru and between Gru and the actual figures than with the projected figures, if that makes some sense. Um, the committee argued that the discrepancy between projected and actual figures was due mainly to lack of preservation and loss of objects, possibly as a result of embezzlement or theft. They expressed their, expressed their surprise that so many of the precious stones were missing. Once again, in the 1760s, um, 
In fact, in November 1763, 100 years and one month after the first reference to the repository in the Society's Minutes, a report described how action describes how action once again had to be taken in order to revive the ailing repository. They began by looking at the objects of natural history, finding many specimens of animals and vegetables totally decayed and perished, and such they have thought proper to turn out of your repository, not only as useless and disgraceful, but even as pernicious, for removing the animal bodies so decayed and in a state of putrefaction, the air in the room became intolerably fetid and they were all sick. Once again... Once again, a committee was set up to revive the repository, and this seems to be the committee that worked. Even though this was around the same time that the repository's keeper, Emmanuel de Costa, as some of you might know, was dismissed for embezzling the society's funds, documentation of the collection improved in the 1760s. Although no printed catalogue was produced, a running inventory was compiled, and a donations book backdated to the 1740s was constructed. The Society also appears to have changed its approach to developing and building the collection. They worked closely with the Hudson's Bay Company and received extensive donations from them between 1771 and 1776. The success of this collaboration led them to approach other trading companies, such as the East India Company, the Turkish, Russian and African companies, to see if they might also be prepared to make an annual donation of specimens. Given the limited British colonial presence in South America and California, the Society also proposed an exchange of items between them and the King of Spain. They were also keen to establish correspondence networks with various individual agents and appear to have been particularly successful in attracting donations from those in the US and the Caribbean. Crucially, the ultimate aim in the 1770s was to build a collection of natural history that might be worthy of the Museum of the Royal Society and perhaps become a national honour. And again, this is very interesting because, as you probably know, at the time the British Museum was fairly well established by this point and a lot of the fellows of the Royal Society were also trustees of the British Museum or on various standing committees. And so this kind of aspiration of wanting to create a Museum of National Honour I think is, is quite an interesting concept. Although there doesn't seem to be much information about the reception of the repository at this time, it can perhaps be gleaned by assessing how the collection was being used. This is the jawbone of a mastodon. It was found in the late 1760s and is currently on display in the Enlightenment Gallery at the British Museum. Well worth a visit if you haven't made it there yet. It was initially believed to be an elephant's jawbone, but William Hunter was keen to disprove this and demonstrate that, in fact, these bones had more in common with what he terms the elephant in Siberia, the mammoth, um, than what he calls the real elephant. By studying items crucially from the Royal Society's collection, in addition to the British Museum and separate private cabinets, he was able to demonstrate that the jawbone was sufficiently different from an elephant's for it to be a distinct species. And his findings are published if you're interested in Phil Tran's 1768. Specimens are also being used by naturalists to study the characteristics of a particular species. Thomas Pennant drew extensively on the collection in his numerous published works, for example in his synopsis of quadrupeds, um, and here he's discussing various sorts of deer. The repository specimens also participated in generating commercial knowledge. In 1773, they wrote to the Hudson's Bay Company to advise them of how the natural production sent from them, from the Hudson Bay Company to the Royal Society, might be used as materials in manufacturing. They found that buffalo hides from Hudson's Bay were as good as the skin of the Russian buffalo for bookbinding, and that the buffalo's chin hair might be used to make a pair of stockings. Perhaps slightly itchy, though and suggested that swan down could be used to make powder puffs, and apparently uh, there was a great scarcity of good swan down to make powder puffs at this time, so this was, this was very, very important information to be communicating. Although things seemed to have been going well, the repository was building a collection particularly strong in North American material, was attracting various important donations from across the globe, it was being used for considerable useful and philosophical purposes, contributing to commercial knowledge, in addition to the collection seemingly being met better maintained than in previous years, this period of success was to be short-lived. In 1776, the government intimated that rooms at Somerset House could be made available for the use of the society. Consequently, architect Sir William Chambers was instructed to draw up plans for their move. The allocated rooms were far from spacious and led Chambers, either accidentally or possibly intentionally, for failing to fail to allot an area for the repository in his design. Interestingly, he did allot an area for their library, but not their repository. Again, very interesting, I think. 
Um, although a solution was offered to incorporate the repository into the meeting room, this was deemed to be an unsatisfactory compromise. And by 1779, the Council of the Royal Society judged that the repository ought to be removed to the National Collection. So the repository was finally transferred to the British Museum in 1781. Daniel Solander appears to have been responsible for overseeing the transfer and organising the collection upon its arrival at the museum. In November of that year, further cases were ordered by the British Museum and a carpenter was employed to mend existing cases, plus a person to properly set up some of the animals and birds. Still, it's difficult to see how far the museum progressed with this, given that shortly after, in May 1782, Sir Lander died of a stroke aged only 49. How many of the Royal Society specimens survive today is difficult to say. Time and regular cremations by an early 19th century curator at the British Museum have meant that, in general, few of the 18th century bird and mammal skins remain. And the method of documentation at the time means that it's difficult to conclusively say that any object was a former Royal Society specimen. However... The spirit collections, together with other medically related items, plus a large part of the British Museum's osteological collection, was bought by the Royal College of Surgeons in 1809, and amongst which there were a number of Royal Society specimens, most notably John Evelyn's tables and a tusk donated by by Thomas Crisp, both of which are currently on display um, at the RCS, and again, well worth a visit if you haven't made it there already. Again, a lack of documentation does hinder the identification of further objects. In terms of objects of natural history, which were transferred to what we now call the Natural History Museum in 1881, there were a few items. In botany, extensive work has been carried out on the Chelsea Physic Garden's annual donations of plants to the Royal Society, many of which have survived. Similarly, our um, sea monster can also still be found in the museum. A number of the artificial items, such as William Petty's twin-hulled ship, have also survived and You'll see that when you take a tour in a couple of moments' time. The key aims of the Royal Society when setting up their repository was both to preserve objects and employ them for the furtherance of knowledge. And although few remain extant, the way in which they were recorded in the Society's archives, described in various works and crucially used, can contribute greatly to uncovering scientific practices in the long 18th century and demonstrates how a collection before the British Museum might still be employed for considerable useful and philosophical purposes. Thank you very much.